Just like how many horror stories are told and many horror movies come out near Halloween, the same thing happens in Japan during Obon in the summer. The existence of Obon has a great influence as to why ghost stories are told and shared in Japan, specifically in the summer. But you might be wondering, what is Obon? In Japan, just like in different cultures all around the world, it is said that the spirits of ancestors return to visit the world of the living during this time of the year. Unlike Halloween, All Saints Day, and All Souls Day, Obon doesn't have a fixed date. Instead, people are expected to visit the grave of their loved ones on the 13th of August to welcome their return. But the actual Obon is almost a week-long holiday. And now that it's summer in Japan, what better way to welcome this season than to talk about horror stories. English teaching in Japan horror stories, to be more specific. The living is scarier than the dead in most cases anyway. A few days ago, I asked my circle and several groups to share their horror stories while working in the industry. And I got some pretty interesting and absolutely terrifying stories. If you click this video hoping to hear some actual ghost stories in Japan, well I'm very sorry to burst your idea bubble, but this is way scarier than ghosts. For legal purposes, the actual names of companies and people were omitted from these stories. I also included my own experience, so if you can guess which one is mine, I'll give you a prize. In the afterlife. All jokes aside, again, for legal purposes, I'm not gonna say which story is mine, and if we know each other in real life, please keep it a secret. Let's get started with our first story. When I first came to Japan, I didn't know that I would be working under a murder. My school manager was responsible for the death of a Japanese teacher a few years ago. She was not convicted, but the police investigation led to the conclusion that the death of the young Japanese employee was caused by all the stress and harassment brought by the manager. I will not go into the specifics, but I couldn't believe that a person like her was allowed to continue to manage people for many more years after everything that happened. If you don't know it yet, the concept of firing does not really exist in Japan, especially in very traditional Japanese companies. In this story's case, if the company let the manager go during that time, it's like they were really admitting that it is the company's fault that's why the Japanese employee self-exited. What most companies in Japan would do if they want to get rid of an employee is what most people nowadays refer to as quiet firing. They will assign that employee to a far and undesirable branch or give them less to no responsibility at all or remove them from their original team until eventually the employee quits voluntarily. Japanese people are really not very fond of confrontations. Let's move on to our second story. I was working at an English conversation school and my boss sat me down one day to tell me that I should either cut my hair short or dye my hair all black. Back then, I had some light discoloration at the ends of my hair due to sun damage. When I asked her why, in her words, if you don't do it, people will think you work in the red light district or the night industry. I was shocked and didn't really have any words. It dawned on me that she probably wouldn't have said that if I wasn't from the Philippines. Well, that one hits home since I'm from the Philippines as well. You see, entertainment visas were easily given to Filipinos until the year 2006. There was even a point when the number of people with that said visa from the Philippines reached over 120,000. And I think that really contributed to some Japanese people associating Filipinos to night pubs. If you go to the red light districts in Japan, you'd still find many pubs with the flag of the Philippines to this day. Recently, of course, many Filipinos have been coming to Japan to work in other industries like education, engineering, IT, and caregiving. But I think older Japanese people still have this idea that if you're a woman and you're from the Philippines, then you must be working in a night pub. This, of course, doesn't excuse the ignorance and rudeness of the writer's boss. Let's look at our third story next. When I was working as an ALT at an elementary school in the Japanese countryside, I had plenty of opportunities to introduce my home country, which is the Philippines. I introduced my culture, music, food, festivals, and all the amazing things about it. I'm aware that my country is not perfect, but I was taken aback when out of the blue, my JTE or partner teacher started a presentation about the Smoky Mountains in the Philippines and how Filipinos eat from garbage and live on top of and among the garbage mountains. Throughout her presentation, my students kept giving me side glances, some with obvious disgust and pity on their faces. I wanted to cry but held it together. When I confronted my JTE after the lesson, 
She said that she felt it was necessary to talk about it as it falls under SDGs. I wouldn't have had any issues with it if she talked to me first to make sure that her presentation was not outdated and did not present the worst of the situation, which was many, many years ago. My relationship with her was never the same after that. We can probably give the JTE the benefit of the doubt and say that she meant well. What I don't understand is why she didn't tell the ALT about it beforehand. She literally had the best resource, someone from that country at her disposal. But this makes me feel that it was a deliberate move and it was done with ill intentions. But you know what? Who knows though? She might really just wanted to talk about the SDGs. <laughs> and on to our last horror story for today. I worked at an Kaiwar, an English language school in a pretty decent sized city. My center manager had clearly expressed that she didn't want me there. She would slam doors in my face, ignore my questions, ask me to go and distribute flyers for many hours regardless of the weather conditions and berate me for not having lessons even if they were out of my control. But the worst was in my last few days at work before my contract ended. The main company was transferring me to a different branch because they were aware of my situation too. She started telling me that there was no way I could transfer because she would never ever give me a recommendation letter which was necessary to transfer. She said how could a bad teacher like me even think of working at another school? She also threatened to take my visa because I didn't deserve it. Since it was my first year in Japan, I didn't know any better and was just stressed and depressed overall. I eventually made it to another branch school and had a better experience. But oh god, how I wish now that I sued the hell out of that woman for all the psychological stress she caused me and the many others after me. I know it's hard. But if you're working under a person like this in Japan or anywhere really, please know that you don't owe anybody anything to stay in that situation. Please protect your heart and sanity and make the decision to leave. There's also a rise in reports of power harassment or pawahara in Japan. So please don't be scared to report that person. Although the rise of reports has increased tremendously in recent years and the news outlets have finally been covering it, this has always existed in the workplace. The only way to stop it from happening to the next person is to start the first difficult step with you. I wish you all the courage to make that move. And that's it for today's video. We covered four heavy stories today and I hope to share some heartwarming stories in the future. Please be safe out there and I'll see you again in my next video. Mata ne!